Welcome everyone to another brand new episode of the Preventive Medicine Podcast. And today we're going to be talking with uh, someone and in a topic that I've been looking forward to talk about for a quite a long time. Actually, since the beginning of this podcast, I always have these lists of things that I want to talk about. Um, and I keep trying to like cross them off, add to it. And this is one of those ones that hasn't been crossed off until today. Okay. And also another new thing today is that we are actually going to have a new intro. So look forward to that. And um, with that, let's get into this episode. Overcoming saber-toothed tigers and woolly mammoths, we must now face a new enemy, ourselves. With the rates of diseases such as heart disease, stroke, diabetes, depression, and many others ballooning, we must find a better solution to these modern epidemics. Welcome to the Preventive Medicine Podcast. We believe in building a foundation of health by means of prevention so that you can build the life you want and find fulfillment with no barriers. Hear from experts around the country on how to take your health into your hands. Take control and build a foundation of health for the life that you want to live. And now, here's your host, Raghav Sharma. We hope you enjoy the show, and if you do, please don't hesitate to subscribe and like for all of our future content. So today we are talking with Dr. Samina Rahman. Um, she actually is a board certified gynecologist. And that's something you haven't heard on this podcast before. Like I was saying, this is something I've been looking forward to for a long time. She completed her uh, MD at University of Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, ended up doing the uh, her residency at the University of Massachusetts in ob Gun, and was faculty at UCLA before coming to Chicago and now actually owns a private practice. Um, where she's kind of interested in women's sexual health, menopause management, and cosmetics, and is actually building out a studio, which is why a lot of the scheduling behind this episode actually took quite a bit, but she's so busy doing that. Um, and then also, on top of that, she's also the clinical assistant professor of ob Gun at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. So, Dr. Rahman, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. Um, yeah, we've, this has been a process trying to get us together between our schedules, but I'm glad to be here finally. I'm glad to have this happen finally. So first question is, tell us a little bit about what you actually do. Um, most people think of ob guns as just kind of delivering babies, but you actually have a private practice. So what do you do? Why did you decide to go this route? And yeah, kind of tell us a little bit about yourself. Awesome. Yeah. So I, um, you kind of heard my background. I um, had been in academic medicine for a very long time and was still delivering babies at that time. And then um, once I had kids, um, I have three children now. So once I had kids and after that, I realized that, you know, I wanted to kind of um, give my patients a little more time too, because, um, you know, in, in large practices, whether they're academic or private, sometimes you get in a situation um, where if it's not your own, um, you, you don't have the ability to schedule the way you want. You end up like having to churn out 20, 30, 40 patients at a time. And, and after a while, I just felt like I wasn't providing the kind of care that I really felt like um, I should. Um, you know, and then sometimes with in, in, in a combined OBGYN practice, your focus becomes so much about, you know, all the pregnant patients needing you, the urgent issues around that, that um, a lot of gynecology issues kind of get shoved under the rug because, you know, you're always trying to deal with the more acute processes. And so I decided, um, you know, my actually my husband's an interventional pain doctor. So he had opened a private practice and then was like, you need to open your own practice. And I was like, oh, sure, because that's what we learned in medical school, <laughs> which we don't we don't learn how to you know open practices or businesses or anything. So it was a little bit of a process. And then um, over time, I realized that, you know, some of the issues that were coming up around, you know, menopause management or, you know, sexual dysfunction or pelvic pain were not things that were really emphasized in, you know, um, a lot of training. So I went out and did some of additional training on my own with the, with some mentors. And finally, like I'm at a place where I've created sort of a, a niche boutique practice where um, those are my emphasis, you know, my emphasis is on sexual dysfunction, pelvic pain, menopause management. But I see a wide spectrum of gynecolo gynecologic issues and do a little bit of cosmetics as well, um, which I trained when I was in Los Angeles. So, yeah, I mean, it's been a bit of a ride. I mean, going from academics to private practice is always a little challenging, too, because, you know, in academics, you kind of don't look at private practice docs the same way. And so it was one of these things where it was a it was a good move for me. And and now I kind of have control over my schedule and uh, control over how I can you know take care and manage my patients. 
Really quickly, this may seem like a basic question, but for a lot of those listening at home, they might not know the difference between obstetrics and gynecology because it's typically yeah. just lumped into like ob gyn. What yeah. is the difference? Are those two different fields or the same thing? What's the difference? The training is the same. You, you go to a, do an obstetrics and gynecologic um, residency, but the obstetrics portion is really like, you know, the process of in the reproductive years when um, individuals with uteruses then end up, um, you know, getting pregnant. And so you deal with their pregnancy and their, um, you know, postpartum issues and the deliveries and all that stuff. And then the gynecologic portion is, you know, anything related to women's health, uh, you know, irregular bleeding, annuals, paps, um, uh, breast exams, you know, breast management. Um, so it's a wide spectrum. And then, you know, you can kind of, uh, and then people can go on and train, you know, in different subspecialties like training on um, your gynecology, which is like bladder, urinary system, um, you know, or, you know, uh, minimally invasive surgery. So those are the specialists in like endometriosis surgeons and fibroids, you know, fibroid removals and all that stuff. So there's a lot of subdivisions. GYN oncology is another subdivision. So um, some of those require, and reproductive uh, endocrinology and infertility. So some of those require, you know, additional, you know, three years of training. Um, but um, the, the whole field is really, um, treating individuals with vaginas, uteruses, you know, breasts, the whole spectrum, um, and some of the issues around all of that. Definitely. So now that we've kind of got a basic of what you do, what the field is, how does it relate to preventive medicine and what does preventive medicine mean as a whole to you? Yeah. I mean, preventive medicine is really key for all, you know, um, I see, you know, these individuals, these patients sort of like in their reproductive years and beyond. So when I start seeing them, you know, past the point where they're delivering, they're past, you know, wanting to have children or, you know, in the process of trying to have children, you know, prevention is really something that we can do a lot of, like even in the area of obviously like pap smears, um, breast exams, those are all sort of preventative for cancer, right? Like you're looking to screen out cervical cancer or with the pelvic exam, trying to make sure that no one has ovarian masses. Uh, same with the breast exam and the mammograms. But then, you know, there's a whole other aspect of preventive health that I look at too. And um, say you look at, and, and the same with STD prevention, sexually transmitted diseases, but you can look at a subset of even patients that have or that might end up having sexual pain or sexual dysfunction and how you can actually like even combat some of that. So a lot of it is dialogue, right? Just teaching your patients a little bit more about, you know, the medications that they might go on, how it might impact their sexual, you know, function. I have a lot of patients that have pelvic floor dysfunction where, you know, like their muscles are just, you know, in, uh, the, the tone around the, the vagina of the muscles just have a lot of is have increased tone until it prevents them from having, you know, pain-free intercourse. And so a lot of times if I'm suspecting somebody is um, really anxious during an exam or, you know, they've never used tampons, some of that I can even work as a preventative. They've never had sex, but, you know, this is an individual that's never been able to insert a tampon. So let's try to prevent that painful sex journey by talking about it now. Um, and the same with, you know, menopause. So like when we talk about individuals that stop menstruating, um, at some point, which the average age is 51, I start the prevention early on. I say, you know, like in, you're, I'm seeing individuals in their 40s and then I'll, I'm telling them, you know, menopause is coming in the next 10 years. This is what to expect, you know, and then we know that it, uh, these individuals are more at risk for heart disease and other things past that age. So then we start working on, you know, cholesterol screening and sending them to their primaries and all that stuff. I really like that aspect of dialogue that you mentioned. And a lot of times when people think of preventive care, they think that something has to be done when that something sometimes can just be dialogue. And I think that's very pertinent to uh, reproductive health and just females health in general, because um, a lot of times just females are just uneducated about their own health, their own organ systems, what's going to happen, what's going on during puberty, what's going on during kind of uh, menopause and all these different things. And they just don't know what to expect. And then sometimes things get taken by surprise. They don't know how to react to certain things. Yes. They find remedies, quote unquote, online, um, which may be harmful. We don't know what those remedies are. Yeah. So I think that dialogue is really important. I like how you mentioned that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think as, as physicians, one of our biggest roles is educating. Um, you know, we're teachers, we're educators. So I think that um, I take that role very seriously. And I, I take make the time, which is the benefit of having a private practice I can carve out you know, that half an hour with the patient and talk to them about all these means to prevent, you know, some significant issues down the line. 
Definitely. So going along with dialogue, one of the questions that I want to ask is that we mentioned just there's so many different areas to practice prevention when it comes to sexual health, when it comes to just uh, gynecology and all of that. But Mm -hmm. how can people be active participants in their own sexual health? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, just being aware of, you know, diseases out there or, you know, um, when and how you get pregnant. You know, it's surprising for me. Sometimes I'll see and individuals and they're like, oh, I didn't realize that, you know, there's only the fertility window is the only time I can really get pregnant, you know, and so some of that is just educating um, people about their reproductive cycles or, you know, what's normal and not normal in terms of, you know, vaginal and vulvar health. Um, You know, I think that um, just uh, educating them on, um, you know, prevent, prevent pregnancy prevention or trying to conceive or, um, you know, uh, screening them for the sexually transmitted diseases that might be there or what's abnormal down there. A lot of, a lot of individuals now Google a lot, they'll go down a rabbit hole and they'll come to me scared because, oh, I think I have this symptom. And so a lot of it, again, is educating um, and helping uh, patients understand their reproductive um, um, health care as well as, you know, um, having sex and all that that goes with it. Sure. I know you mentioned Google in there and that people will often try to be active participants and end up Googling things that can either scare them rightly so or sometimes wrongly so. Mm-hmm. A lot of times you see patients where there's actually nothing going on um, and we're like, you don't really need to be here. It's completely normal and you educate them. And then sometimes you come in and it's too late and people have not known that this is all going on. They thought this was normal. Um What are some actual things that people of, uh, let's say, let's specify by age group, because I know this differs by age group. Mm -hmm. Let's say people who are pre having a baby, let's Uh say, what are types of things that they need to look out for that they might need to seek care for? Yeah, I mean, it goes, I mean, there's a full spectrum of things, right? Like if if you're talking about a psych, uh, your, your menstrual cycle and looking at your menstrual cycle, if it's, you know, um, very heavy, uh, if you're changing your pad every hour, every two hours, having large blood clots, if it's, if you're not getting a cycle on your own, you're not on birth control pills or any form of hormones, and you're still not menstruating, you all of a sudden notice, you know, acne, facial hair, and these kind of things around that, Um, you know, some of these can be signs of either structural issues happening with the heavy menses or lack of menses. We're talking about maybe ovulation defects or um, a large spectrum of um, disorders around that. So I think that knowing, you know, what's, what's normal for menstruation. Um, you know, we're talking about, you know, 21 to 31, you know, that whole cycle, um, interval between your cycle, as well as the length of the menstruation. And then even understanding that, you know, pain, you know, cramps, maybe mild cramps, a a lot of individuals get, but pain with your menstrual cycle, you know, sometimes can be a sign of things like endometriosis or adenomyosis. So some of that, when you, when you, when I talk to individuals and ask them, you know, why did you go on birth control in your, when you were 15? And it's because, oh, every time I had my period, I passed out at, at school because I was in so much pain. That actually is a means for me to discuss the possibility of other disease processes like endometriosis and other things, which maybe they were never, you know, brought upon. And this can help then like down the line, say they do have endometriosis, um, or, you know, other like structural issues around their uterus, um, then we can talk about how that might affect their fertility. So, um, and then when it comes to like your vulvar and vaginal health, you know, there's a lot out there, you know, uh, social media is great for so many things, but, you know, I I always tell patients (laughs) that are very anxious, like, please don't go on social media, like, unless you know who's telling you the information, like, you know, if it's if it's someone legitimate, you know, board certified, someone that, you know, isn't going to sell you snake oil, then, you know, it's fine to kind of like, you know, inquire and then come to me with your actual issues. But, you know, don't go on there, you know, listening to someone that, you know, maybe has no clue about what's happening really. But, you know, when it comes to vulva vaginal health, you know, abnormal discharge, you know, um, itching, burning, those kind of things, there's things to look out for as well. Those that not normal. And one of the other things that I want to ask, and one of the biggest things, we also meant, already mentioned this previously, is the pap smears. Yeah. I know you don't necessarily do guy and onk, but kind of, can you explain what a pap smear are and why are they important? Is this yeah. something that everyone yeah. should be doing regularly? Right. Now, pap smears are screening tests for cervical cancer. So if you think about your womb or your uterus where you carry a baby, the neck of the uterus is called your cervix. Those cells can wrap, have a normal process of rapid turnover. And basically, um, you know, 
those cells can then get affected by a virus called HPV, which is the human papillomavirus. It is the causative agent of cervical cancer. And cervical cancer is important because it impacts um, individuals with cervixes in their reproductive years. So uh, younger patients tend to get this cancer, although not as commonly in America anymore because we do rigorous an um, annual screening. But most of the time, once you, you know, start having, um, you know, penetrative intercourse, you know, start having intercourse actually of any type, um, you should start getting screened for pap smears um, starting at age 21. We used to screen before that, but we realized we were kind of over screening. And then you can really go like three years, every three years, if you have, um, you know, a normal pap smear, um, you can get screened every three years. Um, and then up to five, depending on if you're after age 30 and you have no HPV that's been identified. Sometimes I'll adjust that rule in my, my patients because they're anxious about it. And I'm like, well, you've had a couple new partners, so it's possible you got a new HPV exposure. One of the best things we can do to prevent you know, cervical cancer is actually getting the vaccination um, for Gardasil. And Gardasil is um, the HPV vaccination that vaccinates against nine HPV variants, which two of them... Um, 16 and 18 are the most sort of aggressive forms of HPV that cause 85% of cervical cancers. So I have individuals that have never been vaccinated when they get infected with this 16 and 18 strand, they can have, you know, multiple issues down the line and even develop microinvasive cancer over time. So pap smear is very important. If you look in developing country, you know, cervical cancer is still, you know, among the top three, you know, cancers for, for, for individuals with cervices. So um, that is an important part of preventative health. And I um, stress it that we should, you know, definitely yeah. get those done. I've been trying to keep track of when uh, people or when our guests mentioned different forms of prevention that I kind of keep in my head the different uh, types. So there's like the primary, secondary, the screening would fall within the secondary uh, form of prevention where it's like, uh, like looking for diseases that are there, but not necessarily advanced. And then you can do something about it very early on. But then I also like how you mentioned the vaccine, which would be a form of primary prevention. Um, so you kind of prevent it from happening in the first place. Um, does getting the vaccine preclude you from getting pap smears in the future or do you still do both? Unfortunately not. And it's because we've identified like, you know, I think close to 200 variants of HPV. So it's kind of like when you get the flu shot and the flu vaccine, like you're protected um, against maybe getting really an aggressive um, attack or, you know, aggressive flu but you still can get it because there's so many variants out there. Now, the upshot of, I think, um, the Gardasil vaccine is, you know, it does protect you against some of the variants that cause genital warts, as well as um, the variants that cause, um, like I said, the most aggressive one, 16, 18, that cause 85% um, of um, cervical cancer. So um, we use it uh, and then we emphasize the importance of it because, and, and now it's approved for individuals up to 45 years. It used to be 26 years. So the FDA got on board with that because they realized people are, you know, having uh, different types of relationships, divorces, remarriages, and all that stuff. And so I think um, the realization came up that, you know, we need to protect these individuals further on. And then this may also seem like a basic question, but uh, this is a relatively important topic. And outside of the vaccine, what else can people do for primary prevention, not only for HPV, but I guess STDs in general and all of the other things that might come along with intercourse? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, big thing is condom use, right? Or, you know, um, dental dams and what, you know, that, that uh, depending on who you're, what, what type of sexual activity you're having. But I mean, um, and unfortunately, condom use doesn't protect you 100% against HPV because like oral inter oral sex and, you know, um, skin to skin mucous membrane contact can, you know, you can still get HPV. So that's why we still screen. But it does, it's very effective against, you know, gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas, some of the other STDs. Sure. And now we're going to switch gears just a little bit. We've been talking about, uh, I guess on this podcast, we talk a lot about the intersection between various lifestyle factors mm -hmm. and disease uh, processes. For example, smoking, poor diet, sedentary lifestyle leads to kind of cor cor uh, coronary vascular disease, cardiovascular disease, all of those things. Is there a link between those and female sexual health? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think that um, when we treat... Um, sexual health issues or sexual dysfunction or female sexual medicine in general, there's an intersection of, you know, the biopsychosocial model of how we treat individuals. And so, um, you know, cigarette smoking linked to cervical cancer, just like other cancers and heart disease. Um, lifestyle issues, for sure. I mean, you know, for um, 
individuals, um, you know, who um, there's a lot of factors that actually contribute to, you know, um, female sexual dysfunction. And some of them is like sleep deprivation. If you're not getting that seven to nine hours of sleep, you know, and that can impact, you know, um, you know, when you don't I always, I always emphasize sleep in my office because I've noticed a lot of <laughs> individuals, especially in their midlife, they'll get these issues where they're not sleeping and they're wondering why their metabolic function, they're gaining weight, you know, um, uh, they're not able to concentrate. Um, all these factors, their menopause symptoms are worse and they don't feel like having sex. A lot of that is related to good sleep hygiene, right? So that's one thing I always emphasize. And then, of course, exercise. There are definitely studies out there correlating individuals who exercise to d diminished sexual um, dysfunction. Um, you know, the whole issues around um, sexual pain can be a little bit trickier, but, you know, obviously, you know, good, healthy lifestyle, good, healthy relationships help all of those things. Definitely. Um, as far as diet goes, is there any specific nutritional supplement or anything that people can take that actually has a benefit? Because when you scroll through social media or Google, like all these things are saying, there's like, take the supplement for improved libido, for improved sexual health, improved sexual function. Are there, is there anything that's actually studied out there that's going to help nutritionally? You know, there are some things that kind of help overall in terms of like, say, energy or, you know, um, uh, that diminish other things. Like, say, if you look at, say, like vitamin D, right, we know that there's so many benefits of taking vitamin D, whether or not um, through, you know, sun exposure or actual ingestion of vitamin D. Um, so I think that, you know, there are some benefits in, to, to that. Some, um, and so that those are one of the supplements we always recommend in, in postmenopause too. Um, and then, you know, you look at stuff like magnesium, which we know, like, you know, helps with headaches and inflammatory processes, um, digestion, all that stuff. So if you look at some of those supplements, they are helpful in terms of like libido. Um, there are a bunch of supplements out there that, you know, the studies aren't great. Um, I think that, um, you know, when we talk about like improving libido, we do have some FDA medications out there now that are good for hypoactive sexual desire disorder and, you know, different ways that we treat sexual pain um, and arousal. But, you know, a lot of it, again, is like that biopsychosocial model. So we look at, you know, how your relationships are and how you're um, feeling about yourself and your and about how, you know, your mental status is, right? The psychologic and the psychiatric component of it. Um, is there depression, anxiety? I mean, right now we're in a state where like pretty much nobody's in homeostasis, right? We're in the middle of pandemic. Yeah. There's been social unrest, like, you know, environment changes, you know, people don't have stable jobs or maybe they don't think that they need to take a job because it's not going to pay them what they want or, you know, all these other things. And so I think that with all these factors on board, we've seen anxiety and depression and all these things go up for individuals. And so all of that impacts not only sort of reproductive health, but sexual health. Um, and so that's one aspect I think in, in sexual medicine, we always try to identify lifestyle issues um, as well as relationship issues that might help combat some of these issues that we're dealing with. Sure. And then lastly, I wanted to ask, I know we've been talking about how everything's kind of linked and this question kind of <laughs> gets away from that and asking very specific, uh, particular aspect, but that's, there's a whole bunch of diets that people also say are better one way or another. Like some people say eating a predominantly meat-based diet. Like some people say, I don't know if you're aware, like the carnivore tribe of people out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like those people say that if you eat like this way, they'll have way better sexual function, all this kind of stuff. And then you have the other people that are saying, if you're vegan, you eliminate all of like the fats in your diet yeah. and you will have less coronary artery disease and right. all of this kinds of things that relates to sexual function. Is there any truth to a particular diet being better? Or it's just kind of the general varied healthy diet best. I mean, I think the healthy diet's key. I, I think there are definitely studies about, you know, the Mediterranean diets and, and even um, sort of um, a, a more of a plant-based diet that help obviously improve overall cardiac function, right? And, and overall, um, you know, metabolic function. So if you're looking at improving all those aspects, you're going to get some improvement in your sexual health as well. I mean, we, we know that, you know, in, in individuals with penises, once they have erectile dysfunction, we always have to look at a secondary reason, right? Is there mm -hmm. something else going on? Do they have diabetes? Do they have vascular disease? So, I mean, that can be a sign of other factors. And so I think that when you look about improving your diet, that's going to result in improving your overall um, sexual health, right? And the same is true for, for, for individuals with vaginas and 
uteruses and the like is that you know um improve and and for a lot of times for for us when we improve the way we feel about ourselves because you know um our weight is better or we are or have more energy or we're eating better so as a result we're sleeping better and as a result you know we're exercising we're all these um are, have demonstrated to improve your sexual function so I like how you bring that up as well, because I think that positive body self image is a huge contributor to sexual health, um, whether it's just being confident in your own skin, mm -hmm. um, that you are whatever the situation is. I think that's also a huge aspect to bring up and it plays into that um, biopsychosocial model um, that you've been talking about, where it's kind of all of this plays into one another for kind of not only sexual health, but as we discussed on so many other episodes, just like every other aspect of health. Yep, absolutely. And I think that, you know, that's one of the, the big things we're seeing now is what, uh, when, when our mental health is declining or, you know, the, the, psych, the psych portion of that biopsychosocial model is really um, uh, deteriorating for a lot of patients. And so we're seeing their overall health, sexual, reproductive, everything deteriorate as well. So, you know, getting to like what I like to call homeostasis and how you feel about yourself and your mental status actually will improve a lot of aspects of your life. Definitely. Now we're going to switch gears again. Um, and we're going to go age groups. Uh, we're going to go up a little bit. So now we're going to go to like the perimenopause group. Previously, I was asking questions about kind of people in their reproductive years, maybe before their reproductive years. Now we're going to talk about menopause because like I was saying before, it presents a whole different kind of uh, face of challenges that some people are aware of what's to come. Some people are not aware of. And outside of quote unquote, the normal symptoms like the vaginal dryness, like hot flashes, all of those things of estrogen deprivation, what else are there that women need to keep an eye out for? And kind of actually as a basics, can you define menopause? What is it? And then what yeah. do people need to look out for? Yeah, absolutely. And I have this talk with my, um, my patients in their forties, because I figure like, if you're going to have a talk about puberty, you should have a talk about when this all comes to an end. So, mm -hmm. um, Menopause is really, you know, 12 months um, without a menstrual cycle, um, sort of in your midlife. Um, you know, you're born with all the eggs that you're ever going to have in life once you come out of your mom's uterus. So um, at, at when you kind of finally, finally ovulate that last egg and then, you know, 12 months later, you don't have a, a cycle anymore. Those are that's kind of, that's your final menstrual period. And so that will be, you know, definition of menopause. Um, and so what happens then is you have to think about anywhere you have estrogen receptors, because what happens is you're, you have a sudden, you have a, basically a decline in your estrogen, right? And also your ovaries make testosterone. So you have a decline in your androgens as well. So anywhere you have, you know, these receptors is going to be affected. So we have the receptors in our brain. So that's why people get brain fog. They get the anxiety, they get, you know, emotional ups and downs. Our bones are affected. So, you know, um, even though you might not get symptoms of osteopenia or osteoporosis, you know, it can lead to fractures and stuff. So we always have to talk about protecting our bones. And then, you know, obviously, you know, the vessels are affected. So we have vasomotor symptoms, the hot flashes you hear about, the, the night sweats. Um, and these all then contribute to sort of sleep irregularities that um, uh, individuals in their midlife experience. And then on top of that, you know, the, the bladder and the vagina and the vulva are lined with estrogen receptors. And so um, we have a lot of, you know, frequent UTIs that come in the postmenopause. We have vaginal dryness. We have um, pain with sex that develops, um, which, um, you know, is can really de cause detrimental issues for a lot of individuals in their relationships. And then um, additionally, you might um, also experience, you know, just vaginal discomfort in general. So this constellation of symptoms, which they used to just refer to as vaginal atrophy is actually, we refer to it as a genital urinary syndrome and menopause. And so you'll see, that, you know, these individuals really suffer from these symptoms and we can combat that with, you know, different remedies. But, you know, and we're also talking about, you know, um, estrogen receptors, you know, causing changes in like cholesterol and other things. So I think that, you know, um, the big things that people see are, you know, in the perimenopause, which is pretty much average age around 47, average age of menopause is 51. Um, and so the years leading up to your final menstrual cycle, um, you can start already having these symptoms. You can start having the hot flashes, the night sweats, the brain fog where you can't remember words um, or, you know, the ups and downs, crying, anxiety, depression. Um, as well as irregular bleeding. Um, and then, you know, of course, 
one other key thing about prevention, if we're talking about it, is if you're past menopause and you do bleed, that could be a sign of something else. So we need to look into that to make sure there's no cancer in the lining of the uterus. Again, prevention based on symptomatology. Sure. So speaking of prevention, once again, I know you mentioned something about osteopenia and osteoporosis, and that's something we've touched on this podcast relatively extensively, Mm -hmm. how for females specifically, once they hit that age, they don't have the same support for their bones from estrogen. Um, So kind of weight training and loading and developing dense bones earlier on is very important for females specifically. um, So that when menopause comes that they have a little bit more reserve and can slow down the rate of bone loss with continued resistance training as well. So that's something we've discussed. Um, You also touched on a little bit of the cardiovascular disease aspect because estrogen is also protective cardiovascular disease. And we touched on this aspect with uh, Dr. Sheila Dugan, um, who is at Rush. Uh, We talked about this, how the incidence of stroke and all these coronary artery disease uh, symptoms and heart attacks spike up right after menopause. So that's another thing that we've discussed. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as the sexual health um, aspects that you can talk about, are these symptoms guaranteed to happen or is there something we can do to prevent these? They're not guaranteed. Some some individuals with vaginas will never have these symptoms. They're like, oh, we're fine. And so that's great. Well, I think around 40, 45% of uh, people might. But, um, you know, uh, one of the biggest things, and it's very safe and, you know, it's gotten a bad rap in the past, is, is, is vaginal estrogen in some variety. And there's different forms of it. But estrogen therapy um, to prevent frequent UTIs, to prevent painful sex, to prevent um, vaginal irritation, vaginal dryness, all that stuff. Um, is paramount. We can also use, um, you know, hyaluronic acid for vaginal moisturizing twice a week. Obviously, lubricants are important um, if you're having intercourse um, at this age. Um, And, um, you know, a wide variety of other um, things that we can utilize to improve our sexual health. But I think that for so long, estrogen got such a bad rap. Um, But what we, all the post hoc So, I mean, I'll just say 20 years ago, you know, that Women's Health Initiative came out. It kind of like, you know, um, gave a lot of negative press to the use of estrogen and estrogen progesterone or hormone replacement Mm -hmm. therapy. And all of our post-hack analysis, we know that timing is key. And so, like, for individuals who can take um, hormone therapy with no contraindications, active heart disease, strokes, you know, um, uh, you know, breast cancer, all that stuff, there, we know that estrogen is very protective, actually. Um, if given at that period of time, you know, it's protective mentally, it's protective cardiac, it's protective bone wise. And so, you know, estrogen plus progesterone um, systemically taken can help a lot of those symptoms. But vaginally, um, you know, most uh, individuals can use vaginal estrogen in some form um, and it doesn't really create a a large systemic increase. And so it doesn't have a big impact on some of those um, coronary symptoms we talked about or, you know, breast cancer or any of that. So I think that those things have to be said that, you know, that's pretty much the most important for those individuals having those symptoms. Sure. And I want to bring it back once again to the supplements, because in doing my research for this episode, a lot of times I have like practical experience or have been around it, but this is something that I have no experience with, obviously. So I was doing my research, Googling around, like looking at various forms, going on Reddit for a lot of the problems that people have around this age and the females have around like menopause. And a lot of these seem to be that if they go to their primary care, whoever physician that they go to for care that's not specialized in this, um, that the symptoms are kind of disregarded or not taken as seriously when they're causing a significant impact in that individual's life. And I've seen a lot of people on like Reddit, they would be like, yeah, my physician suggested yoga, which I'm sure it could be helpful if you're looking at like the biopsychosocial model, maybe it has some impact on something, but this results in people taking a variety of supplements as well around menopause. Mm -hmm. Outside of estrogen, which is kind of medically prescribed, is there anything else that can help with these symptoms that uh, people can do at home? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, there are some sort of like phytoestrogens out there as well as, um, you know, some some other, um, you know, forms of like sort of more, you know, maybe natural estrogens or, or what have you that can sort of activate their estrogen receptors. And so there's like estrogen that you can get over the counter, which includes, I think, magnesium um, and, you know, some sort of phytoestrogen. There are other, um, like black cohosh is one of the supplements that has been, you know, shown to help for some individuals with hot flashes or vasomotor symptoms. Um, You know, it kind of just depends on what we're looking at. Um, But there are some things that are are sort of better than others. Um, But the, the phytoestrogens, the soy, sometimes they do help. 
a lot of these supplements like may give you help for three months and then we know that's a placebo effect, right? Like mm-hmm. okay, it helped for three months, but then it went away. So I think that's something to remember as well. Um, uh, but you know, just your, your vitamins, your, your magnesium, some of those things can help some overall symptoms as well. But I think that, you know, um, the ones that I mentioned it are probably the best ones that, you know, maybe have some data behind it as well. Definitely. And then the last kind of part of this podcast, especially for the people that have an interest in this, I like to ask like some of these larger level questions. And one of these that you mentioned is that you were in academic medicine for a number of years um, and you saw a variety of issues with it, whether it's having to like see 40 patients within a constricted amount of time, all of these variety of things that led you to kind of create your own practice and practice how you want to. Um, The question here is, do you think that the system of medicine that we have right now around uh, the reproductive health of females is doing a good job? Do you think we can do anything better? I'm sure this is like a whole hour or two hours in itself, but whatever you want to say on this. Absolutely. No, um, obviously we're not doing a great job. I mean, we're not listening to females. We're not listening. I mean, that's the biggest thing that I get, you know. I went from sort of saving females' lives during pregnancy and beyond to working on their lifestyle and improving their quality of life, right? That's kind of my key thing right now um, with some of the issues that I deal with. And so I hear it from time and time again that people were told, this is in your head, this is common, you have to just suck it up and take it. There's nothing we can do about it. We're not going to give you um, even vaginal estrogen or, you know, local estrogen because it's so dangerous. And it's because, you know, it's, it's, it's multifactorial. One is I think, you know, in a system that's based on insurance reimbursement and all this stuff, you know, um, sexual health and reproductive medicine aren't given um, as much, you know, credence or emphasis. And so, you know, the amount of time that you need to spend to kind of like educate um, females on on their systems and, and kind of empower them, right? Like, I think that's one key mm-hmm. that I try to do, but um, you don't get actually... Um, a lot of a lot of practices aren't going to focus on it because of the lack of insurance reimbursement or or that kind of thing. Some other issues around it include, um, you know, some some uh, practitioners and and physicians out there maybe just didn't get the training. You know, they don't know the latest and greatest data. So you have to kind of keep up to date on that as well. And then we do. I mean, bias in medicine exists. We know this, right? And so we know that, um, you know. Uh, black women are going to be less likely to be heard. You know, women are going to be less likely to be heard. People of color are going to be less likely to be heard. And it's, it's sort of, you know, this intrinsic bias. No one's, most of us aren't malicious when we have experiences bias, but it's really a matter of appreciating the fact that here's a woman or a female that's complaining to me about what's happening. And, you know, she's been dismissed by five other doctors. And so how can I sort of like get to a point where she's not going to get dismissed by me? What can I do differently? We well, can listen. You can listen to what they're actually saying and then, you know, kind of help educate them and navigate, you know, the way that we're going to treat you based on what you're saying and what the workup's going to look like and all that stuff. So I think, you know, our system is broken. You know, you can see that like in the last 10 years, we've come out with two medications for, um, you know, uh, hypoactive sexual desire disorder in females. Now, what, back in, you know, the early 90s or whatever, um, you know, that's when I think uh, Viagra first came out. And, you know, it's much easier to get that paid for than some of the, the medications that we have for, for females. So I think that, you know, there's still that bias. There's still that um, that lack of um, focus on on women's health. and uh, and And so I think, you know, as patients, and that's what I try to tell some of my patients, you know, we need to know what we don't know so we can educate ourselves. And then that can hopefully empower us to, um, you know, improve our quality of life and, and prevent things from happening that shouldn't. That is really powerful. And I think you did a phenomenal job of kind of distilling that entire thing down into what, like three or four minutes. Um, I know there's like entire lectures that uh, can occur or entire lecture series that you can like talk about for all of these, whether it's kind of the uh, biases in medicine, the biases in patient care, um, Mm -hmm. kind of the representation within medicine, Mm -hmm. insurance models based around various treatments that you can have an entire lecture series and all those. I think you did a great job talking about that. I don't think it's my place to kind of dive into those um, because I don't have experience with those. I don't know the right questions to ask. 
hopefully we can get the right people to talk about those and raise more awareness because I think it's something that definitely needs to be done, especially in the scope of prevention as well. Because if you don't talk to females, if you don't kind of value what's going on, then you're not going to be able to prevent downstream issues and you lead to a lot of um, kind of effects on lifestyles and just not being able to do what you want to do and enjoy your life, which is what we like at the end of the day. Uh, Phenomenal job. Oh, thank you so much. This has been fun. <laughs> and then the last question, I know you're a little bit limited on time. The last question that we have is a pretty quick one. And is if you get recognized, let's say you're out for a run in the lakeshore, which I know you like doing. If someone recognizes you and um, they ask you, how do I get healthy in two minutes? What do you tell them? Oh, um, I tell them, um, let's fix your sleep hygiene, first and foremost. Let's um, get out there and move, just move 20 minutes a day, 25 minutes a day. I mean, you know, don't, you don't have to go run a marathon tomorrow, but like, you know, let's start with more movement. Take the stairs, um, you know, uh, walk, walk from place to place. This is Chicago. We can walk more than, you know, even in the winter, most of us can walk from, you know, one block to another. And then, you know, try to, try to, um, I like to, I think that um, circadian fasting and being aware of like sort of your um, circadian rhythm and, 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 and when you should and shouldn't eat is really, you know, critical too to keeping overall healthy. And so I also, you know, always have a discussion about, you know, let's stop eating by 7 p.m. Let's not eat late into the night where we might get more insulin resistance and other factors that might develop. Um, and then, you know, um, try to try to do, try to get sunlight in the morning, try to get a fasted workout. And some of those things that we can just do, you know, maybe here in Chicago, we can't get sunlight every morning, but, but we can do some of these things. I wish prove, prove our overall health. And I think those are the things I like to tell people about. All right. Perfect. I think that's, uh, in our oh, limited time that we had stay off social media when you're like really anxious. because it'll <laughs> your life in some ways. I no. think that might be the most important tip out there. It'll yeah. save you, uh, save you a lot of anxiety. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, I appreciate having you on the podcast. I know we had a limited time, but I think we got through a large amount of topics and covered them to uh, a fair amount of depth that will be able to help some people. I hope you agree with that. Absolutely. This has been great. All right. Thank you very much for coming on. I love what you're doing. So thanks for that. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye.